Hello, everybody. Can I have your attention? I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank you all for being here today, you diehards in the audience who are braving the weather to sit and join with us. It is my pleasure to be in front of you today with my colleague, Mr. Mark Fenton. I'm just going to take a second to introduce myself and then introduce Mark, and then we will get on our merry way with the talk. So my name is Erin Hennessy, for those of you who don't know me. I'm a research assistant professor here at the Freedman School of Nutrition. A fun fact about me is that I am a quadruple jumbo, which means I have four degrees, which means I spend a lot of time here, <laughs> um, but also some time away. I studied community health and biology in my undergraduate years at Tufts. And um, another fun fact is that I grew up in a town called Woburn, Massachusetts. Does anybody know anything about Woburn that's not so glorious? It may have had a book or a movie about it. Yes, a civil action, which is a story of a contaminated public water supply and childhood leukemia. So I grew up in a home that did not let me drink tap water. Tap water was taboo. You did not drink it. And I grew up in a community that actually mobilized itself for action. So at a very young age, it was sort of this juxtaposition of how what you consume affects your body and not always in the most positive ways but that together, a community can come together to create change. And that has really been instilled with me throughout my academic and research training and is one of the reasons why I'm standing in front of you today. I was fortunate enough to have attended Tufts University for many reasons, but also because I got to take a nutrition class in my undergraduate years. And that class was taught by Dr. Chris Economos. And after seeing her present and hearing the material, I said, I know what I want to do with my life, which is a nice moment to have in your junior year. And I started working with her on my first community intervention and got sort of the, I guess, the bite of research, which I still love to this day. But I love community research and working with communities to create change and to understand that in a systematic and rigorous way so that other communities can learn from it. So fast forward, that's part of the reason why today I'm talking to you about a natural experiment that's going on in the western part of the state, which we'll go into uh, a little bit more detail later. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Mark Fenton, who I've known for quite some time. He is a national public health planning and transportation consultant. He has lots of claims to fame, including being the host of the PBS television series, America's Walking. He has competed in the Olympic trials, and he is the most vocal advocate for walking that I know of. And the preeminent go-to person if you are doing any work in this area. If you work in anything related to advocacy, walking, how to change a community to live better, everybody knows Mark Fenton's name. So please uh, welcome him and join in speaking with you today. You. You that was a very kind introduction and much too generous. And Aaron, Frankly, I'm riding on her coattails. I was lucky enough to participate in a couple of, as a, as a sort of a consultant, a practical practitioner, because I'm an engineer by training, actually. I studied across the river at a small technical school and, um, in engineering and uh, eventually got into the field of biomechanics, which led me to cons my interest in public health. And indeed, it's sort of, without, ex without intending, I've ended up in this place where I'm sort of this supposed national expert in environmental and policy approaches to encouraging more physical activity. Um, and indeed, that's what this natural experiment is. The question we're asking is, does that actually work? And not lots of us who are practitioners are out there making the case to local health coalitions like um, what was formerly called Live Well Springfield, and now I think it's called the Western Massachusetts Public Health Institute. They recently rebranded themselves. But um, uh, uh, in fact, Jessica Collins, a graduate of the program here, is their executive director and doing fantastic work at the community level. And one of the things they've advocated for is the very policy we're 
we're trying to look at, which is what are called complete streets. The idea of making streets safer for not just motor vehicles, but pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit, which many of us would call active transportation, those modes that get some physical activity just by their very nature. And indeed, these are the kinds of changes that are anticipated out in Springfield. On the left is a picture that we took just this fall in a, an area called Six Corners. It's a classic urban intersection with six different roads coming in at odd angles, no traffic controls, a, a complete mess, horror show for a pedestrian or a bicyclist to try to get across. Not great for cars, actually, but interestingly enough, in a fairly dense neighborhood, lots of destinations, there's a pizza place on one corner, a gas station on another. The bottom line is, it is going to be reconfigured into that. They're building a beautiful modern roundabout, and whether you like roundabouts or not, what we know from the data is collisions are down, they're safer for all four modes, pedestrians, bicycles, transit, and motor vehicles. They tend to smooth out traffic flows. So engineers all over the country are using them. And people like me, supposed experts in health promotion, are encouraging that. And the bottom line is, we're not entirely sure we've got data that says it actually increases physical activity. Um, there are not lots of studies. Aaron will talk a little more about this, but the bottom line is, this natural experiment is happening throughout the city of Springfield. Projects like this are occurring, and the question we're gonna ask is, are they actually making a difference? Is it, is, first of all, is the policy they've put in place causing this stuff to happen, these changes to occur, and then are those changes actually creating the health benefits that we've been talking about? Um, Quick backstory here. Well, the flow is going to be a little bit of my edification around this. Very briefly, I'll talk about how we ended up even talking about policy and environmental change versus just going out and doing walking programs and the promise of what we call complete streets, this very policy that I've alluded to, the possible benefits. And then I'm going to hand it off to Aaron, who will dig a little deeper into the actual construction of the study. Um, what we all know are going to be many of the challenges of that and the potential unintended consequences of this work and things like that, um, but also our, our aspirations. And we, we hope to leave time. We intend to leave time for um, some discussion at the end. This is the picture that was on the promotional poster, and you might ask why a picture of some guy standing talking to a group of people. Some of you have, in classes that I've been lucky enough to join you here, done this with me, gone for what we call a walk audit. Go out and look at the environment as pedestrians, which is very different than just driving around the environment and looking at the, uh, the actual facilities and so on. This is a workshop done through an organization just like Live Well Springfield. It happened to be out in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. A local health coalition created a partnership with planning, public works, economic development, engineering, parks and recreation to look at their environment and see whether it actually it could be confer the benefits we've been talking about. Um, interestingly enough, as I've been saying, for the last 20 years, I've been doing these kinds of workshops, walk audits and things like this, including some, by the way, in Springfield in 2010 and 2014, without the kind of body of evidence that we've liked. There's correlative research that sort of suggests better built environment, more walking, but is there real cause and effect here? Can you put a complete streets policy in place and lead to these outcomes? Now, here's my deep, dark secret. I didn't start here. I started as a competitive race walker, which is the weirdest event in all of track and field. <laughs> you can, you're allowed to laugh at that photo. That's, that's historic. You can tell it was a very long time ago that I competed in the race walk because we only had black and white photography back then. And the other giveaway is that those shorts were in style back when I was competing. I'm serious, everybody was. Um, and many people will ask, Mark, why race walking? If you were a reasonably good endurance athlete, why didn't you do one of the real events? And the answer is, of course, the huge crowds that showed up at our competitions. <laughs> Not making this up, this is the 1984 Olympic trials 50 kilometer race walk, which is, by the way, the longest foot race in the Olympics. 50 kilometers is 31 miles, making it five miles longer than the marathon. This is the Los Angeles Coliseum. That's the LA 84 games, or 84 trials. Um, we started very early in the morning like the marathon runners do. You start on the track, go out, do a loop in the city, come back, finish on the track. When we finished, several hours later, the stadium was packed. But at 6 a.m., when they started, to avoid the heat of the day, you can look very closely and see my mom and dad right over there. <laughs> That's really them. I'm telling you all this so you know, I came from the classic health promotion sort of model. I worked at places like the US Olympic Training Center Sports Science Lab, at Reebok's Human Performance Lab. I worked for a magazine called Walking Magazine. And during all those years, I did a lot of this kind of stuff, leading mall walks and fitness walking events for the AARP, um, uh, speaking to local health coalitions, taking people out, trying to teach them to race. It's great stuff. I love it. I am a big fan of promoting, educating, encouraging. I am also convinced it's not enough. 
I'm convinced there's a strong body of evidence that says if that's all we do, we are not going to change population physical activity levels. Some of you that have suffered through my class lectures here have been pounded with this message, so I won't burden you, other than to say there are lots of these kinds of studies. This is an intervention study, really high quality work done by a guy, John Chakisik, and his team at University of Pittsburgh, um, published in JAMA. Um, a six month intervention in which over those six months, uh, they did all the things that we think encourage people to be physically active. Call them on the phone, email reminders, uh, set up walking groups. Um, in this, by the way, they compared short bouts for 10-minute walks versus long bouts, one 40-minute walk a day. They even gave some people a treadmill, short bouts with treadmill, SBT. Bottom line is, over the six months, they increased exercise minutes per week, and after the intervention, it dropped off. It didn't stick. We see this again and again in the research literature. Some people refer to this as the check problem or the stickiness problem. It's not that we can't get acute changes. It's that they're not enough if only we focus on the individual. And indeed, there's an entire model, the socio-ecological model, many of you are probably very familiar with it, that says you have to do more. You also have to create environments and policies that are sticky so that when we induce this behavior change, it is sustained. And certainly, our work in tobacco bears that out. We don't just tell people don't smoke. We make it hard to smoke in public places. We've taxed the daylights out of the product. Um, it's not advertised on television, right? We've changed social norms, not just individual behavior. And we've got lots of these kinds of studies. John is still at it. This published just a couple of years ago in which they try to use things like accelerometers and pedometers. In other words, Fitbits. Um, does adding technology change the outcome of the curve? And in this case, the outcome measure was weight loss, not uh, physical activity. Same shaped curve, though. You see the stickiness problem prevail. By the way, a great study recently done uh, in Illinois around worksite wellness programs, similar findings, which is you tend to see the worried well take part, right? They sign up for the program, those who are already thinking about physical activity, nutrition, uh, healthy behavior. Um, OK, so the takeaway is this. People like me and lots of others have said we need to move to a policy and environmental approach. And we should ask a fundamental question. What makes stickier places for physical activity? So that when you get the decrease in weight or the increase in physical activity, the curve goes like that, not like this. Fair question. And the answer is we've deduced basically four things. This is a gross simplification of uh, the research that's out there. And this is that correlative research that I'm telling you about, which says when we look for places where people tend to walk more than less, where they ride their bikes more, where they get physical activity as part of their daily lives, four things characterize them. A greater variety of different kinds of land uses in proximity. So think about having where you live and work and shop and play and learn and pray. Intermingled and mixed, not just segregated into different land uses. Housing subdivision here, mall over there, which is what we've been building for the last 30 or 40 years. By the way, this is not just an urban model. Small town America had this same reality, right? Mixed up downtowns, right, main streets. There has to be a good network of facilities that connect them, sidewalks, bike, bike pathways, and trails, and on-street bike lanes. Um, three, when you get to a destination, it has to reward you rather than punish you for showing up on foot. The modern mall, giant parking lot, You'd be playing Frogger, though, to get to the front door, right? Across that parking lot as a pedestrian. Whereas contemporary historic design was very friendly to the pedestrian. And last but not least, it's got to be safe and accessible for everybody in the community. All ages, abilities, uh, disabilities, all income levels. OK, so that's a gross simplification of where we think the research is. By the way, the Surgeon General of the United States published a document in fall of 2015 called the Surgeon General's Call to Action to Promote Walking and Walkable Communities. And it said basically two things. One, we believe the research is there to support that these environments, these things, make places more walkable. And two, we have to promote them if we're at all serious about promoting walking on a population scale. We can't just tell people to walk. We have to build sticky environments. They could have titled it, holy cow, Mark Fenton was right all along. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Lots of us have been saying this for quite some time. People like Aaron and others have been doing the research that sort of gets us to this place. Specifically, what we've been doing is promoting complete streets. This is a very fundamentally understandable policy because it says this. Whenever we touch a road, we're going to think about all four users, the pedestrian, the bicyclist, transit, and motor vehicles. We're not going to just design a road for cars. We're going to design for everybody. And people like me, when I've been out doing walk audits and workshops, have been promoting this policy. And it very explicitly says, we've got to make sure this works for all ages, all incomes, all abilities and disabilities, all backgrounds. In other words, streets where every one of the users in those pictures, by the way, these are all photos from Springfield, right? When we've gone out and scouted, this is the, the pantheon of people that you see out there, young and old, all abilities and disabilities, trying to navigate the landscape in what we call a physically active way, right? Benefiting the, themselves and the environment. They're not driving a car. All good, but in very challenging, sometimes very challenging conditions. So here's the question. Does this work? 
happily, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that Springfield has gone so far as to actually develop design guidelines that say, when we touch a road, we're going to always ask, can we make it work for all users better than it did before? Not just designed for the car. So these are projects, this is North Main Street, oops, I'm sorry, where they've done exactly that. They've narrowed the travel lanes for cars and added a nice high quality bicycle lane. We saw a cyclist in there, improved crosswalks. Here's a pedestrian getting ready to cross with a high visibility sign, high visibility markings. None of that was there before, but they were repaving that road anyway, and their complete streets policy said that when they repaved that road, they had to ask the question, could we do better for all users? So this natural experiment is literally happening right now. As they repave roads, as they do work, this stuff is happening out there. What a wonderful opportunity to ask, is it going to actually make a difference? Um, by the way, we suspect there are going to be a bunch of benefits. So let me just allude to those briefly. We certainly expect safety benefits. When we use tactics like the ones pictured here, which are part of Springfield's design guidelines, complete streets design guidelines, and the kinds of things they're applying, we should see reductions in collisions, particularly that include bicyclists, pedestrians, but also motor vehicles, and, um, and therefore uh, in reductions in injuries and fatalities. By the way, I, I cite here one very notable study only because it sort of got people around the original question, which is the California Department of Health, which was fairly early in on these, this work in the early 2000s, asked, which was, do we run the risk that as we promote more walking and bicycling, as we lower cardiovascular disease risk, for example, and create stickier environments, we kill more pedestrians. Right? From a public health standpoint, that's not a big win. Right? And that's, we think about that all the time, unintended consequences in public health. right? So it's a very reasonable question. So Pete Jacobson and others have done a bunch of studies, but this was one of the seminal ones that looked at all the data we could find in the US, European cities, and so on. And it said, as you tend to put more bicyclists and pedestrians on the road, you actually lower injury and fatality rates. Um, and that the arrow of causality, they hypothesize, and other studies have sort of borne this out, seems to go both ways, which is to say, as you use these kinds of tools, like roundabouts and things like curb extensions, where the sidewalk here is bumped out at the intersection to shorten the crossing distance and make the pedestrian more visible beyond the parked cars, or median islands like this one, where you don't just make the pedestrian go across, but because of the angle, they're actually forced to look toward the oncoming traffic as they go through the island in the middle and more likely to yield. Um, that those designs invite more walking and bicycling. But furthermore, as you put more pedestrians and bicyclists out there, cars expect to see them and are therefore less surprised and more likely to treat them properly. Right? So it's a two-way effect. Um, an example, by the way, this is going to be happening. They're actually doing some of these in Springfield. This is a four-lane road where a common collision is the left-turning car tries to cut across two lanes of traffic. First car yields, second car doesn't. We have a collision here. So traffic engineers are interested in how do they solve that. Furthermore, though, you can imagine this is a heinous thing for a pedestrian to try to cross. Four lanes of traffic, you need all four cars to yield at the same time. So what they've actually done here is reduce the number of lanes. This is the same road before and after a repaving project what we might call a complete streets project. Now the turning car goes to a center lane, only has to cross one lane of oncoming traffic. Pedestrians can have a refuge island out in the middle, like the one I just described a moment ago, so they only have to cross one lane at a time. Furthermore, we now have room to add a bicycle lane, and up here they've put in bus pullouts. So as we've reduced the likelihood of motor vehicle collisions, we've also improved it for pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit riders. Does everybody see that? Right? That's, that's, that's not rocket science. Traffic engineering is actually a pretty simple sort of field from an engineering standpoint, you know? But here's the point. We have these kinds of studies out there to tell us this work should enhance safety. But what other benefits might complete streets policies put in place? Well, way back in 1981, a guy named Donald Appleyard wrote a kind of a seminal book called Livable Streets. If you were taking a class in UEP, you probably know about this, urban environmental planning, because he's one of the people who gets quoted all the time. And what they did was they asked a very simple question. He found some demographically similar streets, similar traffic volumes and speeds, similar income levels, background of the residents, with one difference. One, ten, one of these pairs of these streets were paired such that some had higher traffic volumes and some had lower. Everybody get that? So it's pretty simple. And then he asked people, he took a map of the street and he asked people, knocked on the door and said, draw a line from your house to where your, your friends and acquaintances live. So on a busy street, you got lines that looked like this, right? A handful of connections, maybe a few across the street. On streets where the traffic flow was less, you got pictures that looked like that. Now I know that that's only qualitative, but it's really compelling, right? Because it begs the question, Am I incidentally getting more physical activity? Is my quality of life higher? Are my social connections better? Is there social, better social capital on the street? He then goes on to look at all those things in the book, and his answer is generally yes, right? Particularly things around social capital. So we expect complete streets might do that to Springfield. 
There's a good body of research that's now evolving, not necessarily from the public health world, but from others, often Department of Transportation, in the case here on the left, New York City DOT. On the right, this is a white paper actually put out by a, an advocacy group called the Alliance for Bicycling and Walking that are looking at the economic benefits of more complete streets. And what they're finding is, and this shouldn't stun you, increased economic activity, higher retail revenue on streets when compared before and after a complete streets project. To their, to their credit, by the way, really high quality research here. They both compared intervention streets to control streets and looked at overall changes in the borough to make sure that the increases in economic activity weren't representative of just you know, a, a general boom in the economy, for example. And even controlling for those kinds of factors. What they found was indeed, as they did things like slowed traffic, add, added bike and bus lanes, uh, took away motor vehicle lanes, widened sidewalks, they saw increases in retail activity. Notably, by the way, people will often ask, but Mark, if I'm riding my bike, how can I carry as much as if I'm uh, driving in, in the car? I can't shop and carry away. I can't purchase as much. And they found that's indeed right. Per purchase visits, dollars per visit went down. What went up? Actual frequency of visitation, right? Because now it's a street that I actually like to be on. And I'm more likely when I go to that street to walk between multiple stores because it's safe to cross the street or it's pleasant to walk along the street and hit two or three establishments rather than one. And really see how that would create a different dynamic. And it opens the door to a host of potential patrons, namely pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit users, that weren't as welcome when it was just a car-oriented street. Um, over here, what they found is that communities are starting to actually sell more walkable and bike-friendly streets, more complete streets, to businesses. It's being used to both enhance uh, business recruitment and retention and employee recruitment and retention, which is why businesses are interested in those communities. So I just need you to know that there's some interesting data out around there in that world, and even in the economic side around housing values, which, which is to say we tend to see housing values higher. People are showing organizations, by the way, like the National Association of Realtors, and the National Association of Home Builders are talking about walkability and complete streets. This is noteworthy because these are not advocacy organizations that care whether you get 30 minutes of physical activity a day. Everybody you know, we want to make sure we're clear on that. These are organizations that are really cared about the economics of this. And that's what they're saying. They're saying, I mean, the headline here is walkability. This is a magazine by the National Association of Home Builders to home builders, right? That's who reads it. And it says, walkability, why we care and you should too. So, what about the last but probably most profound, the thing we're most interested, health impacts. One might say the model is this, pass a complete streets policy, we should get more and better bicycle and pedestrian facilities, which should lead to more walking and bicycling, health outcomes, and of course, a population level, incre population increases in physical activity and then health outcomes. Except it's probably not as simple as that. It's probably have to change the design guidelines, which Springfield has actually done. Change practice, which they are in the process of trying to do right now, namely actually change the roadways every time they're out there touching them which is still probably not enough. So we need the supportive program that organizations like uh, Live Well or now the Public Health Institute, such as you know, getting bike helmets to young kids who, who can't afford them, and bicycles for that matter, and safety training and skills. Um, still not enough, so we've got to feed that into, as people are walking and bicycling, perhaps more awareness, awareness among drivers, right? What do, what do these markings on the street mean? There's a bicycle lane, how do I deal with that when I'm driving my car? So all of that's got to be happening, but thankfully it is in Springfield, and indeed we're engaging with some of those groups as partners in this very process. Notably, then, the pathway to health outcomes is not just through population level increases in physical activity, but as you can see, the safer streets, the economic boost, the, um, uh, the quality of life and social capital benefits. So this basically, grossly simplistically, is sort of the construct that we expect the passage of the complete streets policy to lead to these health outcomes. Um, and the question we're really asking is, yeah, but does it, in fact, do that? And so Aaron's going to share with you some of our, our thoughts about, uh, about how to get there. I will say we go in fully acknowledging the complexity of this. So this is a fairly recent study called the IPEN. It was the IPEN, and IPEN is an acronym for International Physical Activity, blah, blah, blah. Can't remember. But the point is they looked at 14 urban environments all around the world to look for real trends. And what they found is where do you see more walking, more routine physical activity? Higher density of housing, more density of parks, so neighborhood parks, high density of transit, and the quality and connectivity of the network. So we're back to the streets, the sidewalks, the bike lanes, the pathways. Um, but the point is, it's hard to tease these apart. How much is it that we've made, kept the school in the neighborhood that encourages walking and bicycling to school versus that there is a sidewalk from the neighborhood to the school versus that the traffic on that street is slower versus that there's a neighborhood park along the way, right? 
And it's really hard to pull those things apart. So we don't pretend that we're going to be able to. Um, but we're trying to be very aware of this kinds of stuff, and it, and it guides our thinking as we're, we're building the, the plan. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Aaron to actually give you a sense of how we, we purport to do this. I'm going to hand you this and this. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on one second. I did not wear the best outfit for this kind of setup. Things to think about when you present having a pocket. Okay, great. So we actually just came up with a new name. So when you're actually doing a research project in a community, and I'll tell you more details in a second, you need a public facing name that says what you're doing but doesn't overly state what you're doing as to bias it in any way. So um, would love your opinions on it, but literally last Friday, I think we came up with the Roads Project. So research on active design in Springfield. We thought it was pretty catchy. Wow, that sounds really clever, Aaron. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Before I get started, I just want to acknowledge the partners. And I also want to just be really clear as to how this project came to be. So this project was actually initiated by Livewell Springfield. Um, as Mark alluded to, he's been out to Springfield before. Show of hands, how many people have been to Springfield, Mass, or know where it is? OK, great. All right, so take 90 miles east uh, out into actually the west part of the state. You go east, you go in the ocean, so go west. Um, and he's been out there a number of times as this community has tried to come to terms with the issues that they've had, especially in the context of health equity and how to um, and overcome some of the challenges that have been um, longstanding in that community. So Live Well Springfield was formed um, a number of years ago, and it's actually a coalition of 20 different organizations that are centered around not just improving physical activity and sort of the walkability and um, bikeability of the community, but also um, food intake and access to affordable and healthy foods. So there's a number of people, and they were the ones who actually saw a funding announcement come through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and said, we know we have this passage of this complete streets policy. We really know we need data to support you know, whether these changes are going to um, realize anything of benefit to our community, and also clearly document whether there are any unanticipated consequences that come from it. You may have already started thinking of what those might be from some of the things that Mark was saying. But it was from the community who wanted this. And part, uh, the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts, which used to be Partners for a Healthier Community, is aligned with Bay State Medical Center, but is also an independent nonprofit organization. The executive director is a Friedman alum. And so Live Well, um, ha who, the person who runs that also works a part of, um, as a part of the Public Health Institute. So they approached me and said, would you be interested in partnering with us? So a lot of times, academics come into a community and say, I want to study this. And in the other ways, it was quite the opposite. And we are um, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And that is coordinated through their Urban Institute. So what are we doing? What actually is the rationale? I mean, Mark set that up beautifully, so I don't really need to go into too much detail. But I think it's really important to point out the fact that this isn't just Springfield. This isn't just you know, counties in Massachusetts. This is happening. These kinds of complete streets interventions or policies are happening across the country. Um, we are really working hard to think about building capacity, not just in Springfield, to be able to sort of have this landmark moment for this study, but set them up so that they continually collect data and show improvements. Because one of the things that we don't know is what is the lag time between a policy adoption to implementation to behavior change. So can we build capacity, not just in Springfield, but in the community at large, to understanding what data do you need to collect, in, where is it, how do you get it, and what do you do with it when you have it, so that we can create this body of work that will put more communities on the path toward um, better health and more physical activity. We do know that there is actual little empirical evidence about the leading to change. So as we said, we have lots of cross-sectional observational studies. We have some studies that looked at sort of pre-post change, but not with a comparison community. So this is a really nice opportunity to fill that really big gap um, one study, um, so Barbara Brown, who's at the University of Utah, is a consultant on our grant. She had funding from the National Institutes of Health and is actually one of the first to have looked at 
the impact of a complete streets intervention on physical activity behavior. Now, that said, complete streets interventions are not all the same. I have a table to show you. They take on a lot of different characterizations. It could be something as simple as putting in a bike lane to something more significant like the roundabout we were showing, which is happening in Springfield. And in the Barbara Brown case, her work was focused on the um, introduction of a transit stop. And what she found, and some of this might not be surprising, but it is surprising how much we actually don't have empirical evidence for it. But what she found is those who live closest to that new transit line had actually had higher non-transit walking than people who live further away. So a lot of studies will show that if you put in this kind of infrastructure changes, actual people will all around, whether you live close or far, will change behavior. This is one of the first studies to take a different look and look at sensitivities of how far is far, too far before you start to see change. And she saw that those who were living you know, less than a quarter, about a little less than half a mile, um, were the most physical, um, physically active. So it was really nice. They used accelerometers, they used GPS. We're using similar methods, and she's guiding us in that work so that we can understand whether these infrastructure changes lead to um, physical activity improvements. The thing that really is the biggest gap um, that hasn't been done, so one is the objective measurement. So we have a lot of self-reported physical activity behavior. Now, I, I am an advocate for self-reported physical activity behavior. I think it tells you something different than objectively measured physical activity behavior, but there are zealots in the world who believe that you should only ever measure objective physical activity, so we are and um, that will be nice. What I'm really excited about in the work that we're doing is doing the qualitative assessment. I am, was actually shocked to find out that there are almost no studies that have actually talked to residents about how they feel about these changes. Do you like them? Do you not like them? As public health professionals, we often assume that these interventions that are going to increase physical activity behavior are going to be welcome amongst the masses. That is not necessarily true. And that's a voice that's really important um, to share. So I'm excited that we are working on that and being able to fill that gap. And you know, for kind of all of active living research, the, the goal, the promise is to address health equity. So not just making a community equal for all in terms of your sidewalk access, but really bringing up and focusing on those groups that are often disadvantaged or often left out of these kinds of infrastructures and changes. So that's something that's really a big focus of the work that we're doing, is to work with groups that haven't actually been engaged in this kind of research before. So this is Springfield here. So we're here in Boston, and there Springfield is in the darker red. And this is the big map. So for anybody who does research, um, you may already have the same kind of anxiety that I have. So in the world of research, we want to control so that we can just have one thing change and we know what the effect is. We don't get to do that in real world natural experiments. So our anxiety is just trying to figure out how best to measure and monitor and understand changes over time. Um, but as Mark said, some of these changes have already started happening. So it's not like They've adopted this complete streets policy, and you know, April 1, the first set of changes are going into the mix. That's not true. Some of these changes have already happened, um, and they have, are of varying types. So here we have, in the dark orange areas, the majority of the neighborhoods, there's um, 14 neighborhoods in Springfield, that are undergoing changes from either a big infrastructure change to like a roundabout, or a simple wayfinding, or completing a bike lane. Um, in uh, enhancing connectivity versus areas in the city that are a similar socio-demographic characteristics but aren't having those changes um, being done. And if you're not familiar with the community, the community is fairly diverse. Um, it is uh, more racial uh, in terms of Latinos and blacks. It is um, lower income. So you can see here the household median income is 34,000. And 55% live um, below the 200% poverty mark. A quarter of adults don't have a high school diploma. So we're talking about a, a city that really was thriving back in the 1920s, as a lot of cities in our country were. And then for a lot of economic reasons and development reasons has really um, fallen down. Does anybody else know what big thing is also happening in Springfield? Casino, yes. 
Um, so right here where it says Metro Center is right around where the MGM casino is going in. So we have this other elephant in the room, if you will, that we're contending to. And for resources, um, we're not necessarily able to design and figure that out exactly. So what we're doing is just kind of staying away from it and monitoring what's happening, because that casino is going to be done um, before we even get started. So in some ways, that's nice, and we can figure out what changes happened over there. But we're focused more on this area over here and then in our control neighborhoods up there. We're still figuring out how to decide what our buffer zones are and the distance that we're thinking about for our catchment areas for recruitment. But essentially, um, we are very cognizant of the fact that there is a casino going to be in. And that casino, um, although it has some public support, as you can imagine, isn't um, universally uh, accepted in the community. So when I say intervention, this is what I mean. So we have the neighborhoods here, different interventions, different controls. And as Mark and I have talked a lot about, these interventions range quite a bit, you know, from something as simple as adding bike lanes to something much more significant, such as adding um, the traffic calming big roundabout. And so what we're able to do is to really pull a lot of secondary data that lives in the community. A lot of this is just bringing the right people to the table and having the conversations about what data do you have, where and when, and can you give it to me? Because I want to use it. And that's not, it takes time, it takes a lot of relationship building. We have a lot of the right partners at the table to be able to do that. But we're able to say, for all of the interventions that have already been completed, such as here in the Memorial Square and Brightwood area, where is there an analogous area that hasn't had anything? And what are the different sets of data that we can look at around traffic volume, economics, et cetera? And here, this is the area that we are um, focused on in terms of our big intervention. And the part that also increases your anxiety as a researcher is when we wrote this grant, um, this was slated to be done in August of 2018. And the pre-assessment was going to be done right when we got the grant in the fall and a year later. And now we're looking at, because of delays outside of our control, the community delayed it. They think that the, constraints, um, the intervention should be done in fall of 2018. So we're looking at data collection of spring 2018. Super exciting for us because it gave us a little bit more time to get ready with our data collection. But I only want one change. I don't want any more changes. <laughs> the good news is that Springfield has the money. This work is happening. So a lot of times when you're trying to do this work, it's, it's sometimes dependent upon funding. And we know how funding can go. But we do know that this work is happening. When is it happening? I still don't know. Because if you look outside, it's snowing. And there isn't going to be any road work done until the ground thaws. When does the ground thaw in New England? I don't know. It could be <laughs> March. It could be April. So we're, we're working our little tail feathers off to be ready. So the study design is what we call quasi-experimental mixed methods. Really, that's just a lot of fancy words to say that this is an experiment, if you will. Nobody gets the choice of whether they're participating in the experiment or not. It's just dependent upon where you live. And mixed methods means that we're collecting a lot of quantitative data and some qualitative data. And we're doing that in a very specific, concerted way that they all complement um, and fill gaps. We're using a participatory approach and trying to build capacity in the community to do this. I want this work to live beyond this grant, um, making sure that our community partners um, have the ability to do this and hearing from residents and getting local perspectives. So there are different neighborhood councils. So this is a very neighborhood-centric community, kind of like Boston. And there are lots of councils that are active there who are going to help us with recruitment. Um, they will not be recruiting. Where's Shanti in the audience? I'm, I won't have you freak out about <laughs> IRV protocols. Um, but they will be there to help us engage with residents and get buy-in. Um, because why would anybody come talk to me? They have no idea who I am. Um, but also be the ones to do some of the bike ped counts. So going out and standing on a traffic corner and understanding how many people are crossing. You know, that's a lot of um, important work. And if we can build resident capacity to do that, 
They can do that long after we leave and get that historical data going so that they can use it for their own advocacy purposes. Mark hinted at some of the metrics that we're looking at. So you can think about safety, access, mobility, economic vitality, public health, and livability. So our first aim, again, is does this actually lead to implementation changes? And um, what does it look like in terms of traffic and higher economic activity? So this is where we're using from that table the four intervention, four control neighborhoods, pooling data from various sources, um, trying to make friends with everyone, the police department to get crime data, working really hard to get sales tax revenue data, which is proving to be a little bit more challenging. But if not, we can you know, pool simple metrics such as number of businesses. We can also engage the local businesses in some of the qualitative participatory work to understand how this, these kinds of changes have impacted them. So there's other things we can do if we don't have all of the quantitative data that we want, along with getting you know, some new bike ped counts of where activity is happening. So two, the aim, second aim is really around that physical activity behavior. So this is where we're focused on that big infrastructure, that roundabout change that Mark had showed on the first slide um, with one matched control neighborhood. And we will be recruiting 300 people, 150 people in each group. And those people, we hope, are people who can walk, are English or Spanish speaking, who won't be pregnant, not planning to move. There's lots of variables um, in there. But we'll be doing this with partnership with the various community partners and asking people, now this is a big ask, to wear a physical activity monitor and a GPS device. How many people have worn either of those things? Was it fun? Yeah, exactly, right? So imagine people who don't know me, <laughs> who've never done this, at a time in this world where tracking isn't always welcomed. So you know, this is going to take a lot of effort um, to be able to get people to buy into this. Um, and, but I, we think we can do it. But the purpose of doing both is the physical activity monitor tells you me how much I'm moving. It doesn't tell me anything about where I'm moving. You need the GPS to say, that movement occurred on this corridor, on this walk path. Um, you can do that through activity logs. But if anybody's ever asked a participant to fill out a log, you know that the data is unbelievably difficult. Um, and you don't get a lot from it. We're also going to ask those people who graciously um, wear an activity monitor and GPS longer to take a survey. And that's where we're getting some hint about resident perceptions about their psychosocial um, factors, their socio-demographics, and their self-reported physical activity. So we'll be able to get some of that. But who knows if we're asking the right questions, right? So that's where the qualitative data is going to come in and help us. And that's where we're really trying to understand in AIM-3, does Complete streets policy, um, does it change perceptions? How are people feeling about this? We already know from some of our partners that this isn't universally accepted or excited. And that on the other span, there are people who are quite excited about the changes that are happening. And that kind of polarization can also be quite difficult. So what we're doing is we're going to be doing a photo voice project. How many people have done a photo voice project? Do you know what photo voice means? OK, well, you'll learn something new, if anything, today. Photo voice, the voice stands for voicing our individual and collective experiences. It's a participatory technique which embraces the concept which is very true. I am not a community expert. The residents in Springfield are the experts. We're working together as experts in our own domain areas to figure this out. So I'm going to give them a camera so that they can document through their own lens what these changes mean to them. What does trying to live, work, commute in Springfield mean? What are the challenges that they face? What are the things that they like? So you, we want to do this in a not as much of a, a leading way of, does this change your physical activity behavior? But how do these changes in Springfield impact your life? And what's really powerful about this is that you take a picture. And then at the end, so you have you basically the process works where you have a small group of people. It's a little bit like a focus group. You give them a question. They have about seven days to document um, and take their photos. And then you come back together as a group. And they write the, their voice. Why did they take that picture? What does it mean to them? And then they share that with the group. And then through that, you can get through some emergent themes. 
but I could look at somebody's picture and get an entirely different meaning than the intent behind the photographer and what they were trying to do. So you need both their photo and their voice that connects with that photo. And these tools can be unbelievably powerful at the end of the day for advocacy purposes and other um, dissemination purposes because the, the power of an image can really change where the direction of this work is going. The other thing that we're doing is ethnography. So we have an expert on the team who's going to be doing direct observation of various community meetings that are happening um, over the next year. So those range from attending the sort of bike ped um, resident groups to neighborhood coalition meetings to the built environment meetings that are happening. So what are the conversations that are happening around this topic? And how can we document those and really understand how those change over time? But just to kind of put the photo voice into context, I just want to show you um, a couple pictures from work that I did, Mark and I did, um, with some others here at Tufts about 10 years ago. And this is actually one of the first papers and bodies of work that was looking at photo voice in the context of active living. And this is where you know, it's, it's, it's more powerful, right? You have this image of this house. It might be a little bit hard to see, but this is um, you know, a house that's very untidy, unkempt, looks like it might be vacant. And the mother who lives in South Carolina who took it said, there's a lot of vacant houses that have a lot of drug and criminal activity going on. It's unsafe for the kids. And look at how close it is to the road. I don't like my kids walking here. So if you look on a map, you could say from point A to point B, that child should walk to school. If that house is along the way, as a mother, I wouldn't be having my child walk that way. And here, this is taken by a school staff member in Kentucky showing a picture of a road. Our kids can't walk to biker school. Look at that road, it isn't safe. And some of these kids come from really far away. They spend almost an hour on the bus to get here. So the placement of that school had a big impact on whether and how those children could get here. And the part that you can do is you can start to say, well, this is representing the community, this is representing the school, this is representing a sociocultural aspect, this is representing kind of a physical component. So that's where you start to group and understand what the meanings are. So really kind of to wrap things up, what we're trying to you know, do with all of this work isn't just to disseminate it in peer-reviewed literature um, or presentations at scientific meetings. Of course, that's important. We sort of beat to death the <laughs> we need empirical evidence. But we need findings that go back to the participants. Um, as anybody who's participated in research, I know I have. It fires me up when People tell me that they're going to tell me what happened and what they learned about me um, from participating in a study, and then I never hear from them. But also to residents and policymakers. So if we don't actually show positive change, will this movement toward complete streets continue to happen? Or will it start to kind of swing the other way if we say these things actually aren't all that helpful? And we need to get out there to local, state, and national organizations, right? We all need evidence, and we all need you know, the visual image and the stories of the people who live there, both positive and negative, right? Some of these changes, if we're improving economic vitality, that's great. If property values go up, is that great? Will people start to get pushed out of the area that they once called home? So those are the things that we really want to make sure we understand before we have any other unintended consequences. So with that, I will thank you for your listening and invite questions. Any questions? Sure, yeah. Sure, I'm gonna Mark, I'm gonna hand that over to Mark. Why don't you come up here? So uh, there are, and, and lots of them are what you might expect to be the usual suspects. So you've probably heard of places like Boulder, Colorado, and Portland, Oregon. Thank you. And, um, um, and, and so there are a series of those that are kind of those usual suspects, right? I mean, the whole Portlandia. Have you guys seen that series, the TV show, Portlandia? It makes light of all of that. But the reality is it's about 30 years of intentional policy making uh, that sort of helped lead this movement. Um, what's surprising is that they aren't all just the ones you expect. So if you were to ask me, tell me some of the cities in this country that have some of the highest bicycle and pedestrian 
mode shares. That is, they're tra they're, if you looked at all the trips that occur, how many come, happen by car, by transit, by bike and ped, places like Minneapolis score very well, which is a cold weather city, right? More snow than here. Uh, but they've made really conscious policy decisions, particularly over the last decade or so, to build a trail network, to create light rail, to do uh, land use planning, you know, uh, to, to encourage downtown and neighborhood housing development and neighborhood services and so on, so people within walking distance. Um, and I just use that as an example because it's counterintuitive, because it's cold and it's northern, um, but I could tell you about Burlington, Vermont, or Duluth, Minnesota, or uh, Madison, Wisconsin, many university towns, for example, because they have a ready population of adopters. So engineers and planners find it's easier to start to build, for example, bike and pedestrian infrastructure because they know they'll populate it, that people will get out there and use it, which makes it easier for them to then continue to do so to justify to policymakers to keep spending the dollars. By the way, Springfield College, you know, out there, I mean, there's, there's enough going on out there that we're hoping Springfield. Uh, in fact, I would say the, the exciting thing about this is it's a classic post-industrial middle American, very diverse city that's not not Portland, and that's why it's really important to get data from a place like this. Have you looked at New York City? Yeah, um, so it, it, I mean, personally, I've looked at a lot of the stuff from there. A woman named Jane Jacobs wrote one of the absolutely iconic books, right, Life and Death of the Great American Cities, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and used New York as her case study. The problem is it's sort of one of the very grand metropolises, right? I mean, it's sort of on such a scale. It's also it's functional, that's exactly right. And so there are lots of lessons to be learned from that because what's interesting about it is most of the lessons you would take from Jacobs, who published what, in 61, or 63 or whatever, um, to right now, we would hold those lessons to be true because they're scalable. Because what she really observes was it happens on a neighborhood scale. The lessons from New York are relevant down to small town America, if you think about the block. Right, because that's really what she wrote about. So, so yeah, and, and the good news is that you don't, we don't only have New York data anymore. For a while, that was the, you, know, you had to show pictures of there or Amsterdam or Copenhagen, right? And everybody said, oh, but those aren't representative of regular American cities. And we have lots more now. Yeah, and I think that's one You've of the things that. that makes this exciting is that Springfield is more like more communities in America than the New York City or other Barcelona, Portland, you know, where, right. where this has been done, um, where it's, you know, the bicycling rates is less than 5% of the population. And, you know, for people who aren't already living there because they're trying to walk to certain places, will this actually change their behavior? It's, it's you know, it's going to be hard, but we'll see. And the question is, we don't know how much time this is going to take. This is a two-year study, and this type of work might take longer to show all of the benefits, which is why it's important we build capacity for them to do things um, after we're quote unquote gone. Yeah, go ahead. Did you say how involved with city council? Yes. Governance? Yeah. Um, I can speak a little of that because I talked to those guys back in 2014. You know, they did a leadership event that they tried to invite counselors to. And um, there's a wide variety around the country. What we tend to find, if I were to vastly oversimplify, is you tend to find staff, professionals in things like regional planning agencies or in city planning departments are quick to come to this. Public works departments a little more slowly because it has cost implications, so I've got to do things differently now. And elected officials are very cautious because, again, if, it, if they feel like either there's going to be unintended consequences or it's politically untenable or it's going to cost more money in the world of no new taxes and everything else, um, it's really hard. So what happens is, and what they've done a good job here, and groups like Live Well Springfield have done a magnificent job, is talk about what can we do inexpensively when we're paving roads anyway as a part of routine practice. And the elected officials have been convinced this is the big thing. This is the breakthrough. Generally, when you're selling this, we're not selling public health. We're selling economic health. I'm saying this as a practitioner that's out in the field doing bad advocacy work. When I'm doing advocacy work, I'm talking about restoring neighborhood businesses and the quality of life at the neighborhood level and, and that kind of stuff, much more than trying to get people their daily physical activity. That's almost, to elected officials, seen as a secondary effect. Which is why we're collecting data from like the multi-level, right? Like you need to reach people where their agenda is being set, and not everyone is being set by physical activity. So let's collect the data to show them that this is a multi-dimensional benefit to the community. 
So I had this quality of life stuff because that's what communities sell to potential businesses. You know, all the communities that are trying to get Amazon HQ2, this headquarters, there's, uh, whether you like it or not, I'm just telling you those communities are selling quality of life. They're selling millennials want to live here. We're selling, I mean, they're selling stuff like we've got bike trails and we've got, high, we've got neighborhood corner stores and the coffee shops that your employees are going to want to work at. I'm not saying, I'm not making a value judgment. I'm just saying that we've got to be a little Machiavellian as we think about the data that we collect and how we make the case for what we think confers public health benefit. So it's a good question. Question. Wow. Really good question. Are you in UEP? Are you in planning or are you at the Friedman School? It's good that you're thinking about that. So you may have noticed when I talked about how the data works out, and if you look at the data from that IPEN study, and you're going to want to weigh in on this too, but I would say we have reason to believe these behaviors are influenced at three levels. The macro scale of land use, where we put stuff, kind of the meso scale of the networks that connect those land uses, and the micro scale of site design. Is the building at the street or is it behind a parking lot? Are there street trees and benches and awnings? Do you, everybody understand how that's three different scales? And it's three different policy piles. The beauty of complete streets is it hits two of those, at least on the network and the site design scale. Complete streets policies, you know, wider sidewalks, bike lanes, benches, how the bus, bus stop is con constructed. That happens on that micro scale, certainly the network, the meso scale. Um, so the short answer is yes. So there are national organizations doing lots of advocacy work around land use. So a group called Smart Growth, of Amer Smart Growth America, uh, the environmental protection agencies got a, a smart growth group, and the National Association of Realtors got a smart growth group. That publication I showed you comes out of there. Um, so both the public and the private sector, there is a lot of work happening around land use. Um, nobody has sort of coined a term that captures it like complete streets, I don't think. We just talk about mixed land use, compact and mixed land use. By the way, as related to our, those of us that think about nutrition, because I look at both of these all the time, I would add that land use decisions also have to do with containing sprawl. So, so many communities around the country, lots of the middle American communities that historically were surrounded by high quality agricultural lands, every time we go build a subdivision out there and destroy great ag land, we are lengthening, not shortening the farm to table distance. And of course, one of our axioms when we think about nutrition is shorten the farm to table distance, right? We do the exact opposite when we make, um, uh, uh, I think, irresponsible land use decisions. And so I think we should be talking about physical activity and nutrition in the same breath, and the land use is certainly a piece of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that was beautiful. Okay, thanks, I thanks. I really need to <laughs> belabor that. Kind of piggybacking on that, um, have you found, like, um, I know, you know 20 years ago, so when new urban started, kind of becoming a thing, and now you see it a lot with the mixed things that you're talking about. You see architects I mean, you do in, in different ways, and I would say where you don't see it as much as you would want or is in communities like Springfield and the areas that we're trying to impact the most. Um, you see it in, in the wealthier communities when they're doing a new development yep. um, in, in those areas, and, and we're trying to make sure that everybody's at the table moving forward in the right way. Otherwise, we're just going to keep putting gaps in, in widening. It's going to just segregate further, right? I mean, you know, to, to be really blunt about it, when I go to a community, I expect to see more of that kind of development happening in the whiter, wealthier, more educated neighborhoods and not in the ones that don't have as much of a political voice. Having said that, some communities are really trying to get on top of this. I'm going to give Springfield credit. I, I think our vibe is that there's a real awareness of that as they're thinking about as they distribute where the complete streets projects are happening. Um, there's a, They get that. It should be equitably distributed. And I'm going to tell you even great stories. So Nashville, Tennessee, the regional planning authority there has taken an active role when they score who gets money as part of their, their federal transportation set aside. It's called the Transportation Improvement Plan, or PIP. It's an acronym. Those of you that study pl planning would, would have heard. Um, so every year they allocate their federal dollars, the gas tax dollars that come back to the region out. They have a competitive prioritization. You, you submit a grant, you say, we'd like to redo this street. We'd like to build a new bridge. We'd like to fix the highway here. Um, 
They increase the score if you include bike, ped, and transit in the model. Furthermore, they allocate for higher, uh, if you have a higher percentage of low income residents, a lower rate of car ownership, higher rate of obesity, so they actually look at data as they are setting the allocation of transportation project dollars. So that is starting to happen, um, that equity lens. We, and we have models that show it's working. We're seeing projects get to those neighborhoods in places like Nashville that have done this. Um, so they're really excited because that's, that's at that policy level. When you start to shift those levers, it's a new game. Well, so. and I think part of the reason why Springfield's a little bit ahead of the curve, and then I think we'll probably have to wrap up, is it is in part that the MGM casino, you know, that isn't new, right? That's been in the making for quite some time. But through a lot of community input, the design of that casino, it's right in the heart of downtown, right next to the major highway. But it's very different than how you would um, see most casinos, so that you actually, all of the storefronts and businesses are, the, are on the outside. So it doesn't suck life from the streets and bring it into the casino. Everything is actually, you don't have to get to anything that the casino offers other than gambling by going inside. All of the restaurants and all of the shops that will be part of it are on the street side. And the only thing that will be inside would be access to the hotel and to the casino. And that was very, very purposeful Absolutely. to keep up the downtown sort of economic vitality of you know, having everybody on the street, walking around, enjoying the shops and the restaurants, as opposed to going in. Now that said, that's better than, than nothing. I mean. it, it, that was, by the way, to the credit of city council. They were really actively engaged in that process and those negotiations, as well as groups like Live Well that sort of gave voice because uh, the opposite has happened. I've worked in City Joliet, Illinois, where they've got a downtown casino. It looks like a, a freaking penitentiary when you're standing outside. And in fact, you can drive into the parking structure, walk across an overhead bridge, get into the, never see the light of day, do everything you want, be entertained, you know, obviously gamble, but go to shows, eat, sleep, go to the pool, have your kids, right? That's what these casinos have become, self-contained entertainment centers, which do nothing economically for the surrounding city. Uh, and at least some people in Springfield were aware of that, and so there's been some effort. Um, in fact, arguably, it could contaminate our data because you know the, that work around the, the downtown street life is going to influence behavior down there. But let's hope positively for the city. That's what we're really hoping for. So I, we're out of time, but thank you so much for all of your attention. Yeah.